Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and I'm really excited to introduce Kari McDonald to you. Kari brings her years of knowledge and experience in the fossil fuel industry to her new company, Bioenergy Solutions, Inc., where she has a truly innovative business model and a system called the Energy Junction. And this system generates electricity, products for regenerative agri agriculture, such as biochar, biostimulants, and wood vinegar. And it also generates biogas and biodiesel. And through this technology, Kari's building bridges to transition from traditional fossil fuels and fertilizers to sustainable solutions. Kari, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm so excited about what you're doing. Hi, Mira. Thank you for having us. Uh, been very excited to, get to uh, connect and talk more about what we're doing. Well, it sounds like magic. I mean, it sounds like it does everything other than what do windows. <laughs> you, know? you know, when we first stumbled onto this, we, we sort of had that same feeling. And, and what we recognized is that it has the ability to be a bit more fluid and it has the ability to adjust and respond so we can do more than just one thing. And when we first uh, encountered the technology a number of years ago, they were describing it as the power was the waste stream. So, and they, they were really focused on the, the agriculture and the regenesis piece and on the products. And what we've realized it has so many more other pieces to it, so many more other components that make it really fit into different, different locations, different systems, and a variety of different communities. So that's really what got us excited about this. Well, I, I want to start at the beginning-ish um, by by talking about the fact that you come from the fossil fuel industry, which is like, oh, the big monster. <laughs> I, I do, and I still work in the big monster. I, I do. I, I'm still part of that sector. And as we all know, sectors grow and change, and, and we do. I mean, we talk about how how sectors grow up and technologies and knowledge, but I do. I've, I've worked in coal, and I, and I still work with the coal industry, and I've worked in oil and gas. And it was that combination when you start to see industries transitioning and adding to what they have and improving upon themselves. That's really what got us into this is that this is about improvement and transitioning into new areas and seeing what else you can do. It's difficult just to turn a switch on and off without having sort of bigger repercussions to communities and to, you know, livelihoods and jobs. Those are things that are really difficult. And this sort of started to wrap its arms around and go, maybe there's a process, a series of steps we can do. And with it, we found something that had all sorts of crazy tentacles to it and, and has made it really worthwhile. And, and the group that's around us, we have, all of us have some sort of an energy background or, and we have a group that in, within our, within this nest of, of people that are working together that have more agriculture. So it's a very intuitive, you know, build out from resources and traditional um, fossil fuels into a new area together. What, what I love about this is that you are addressing transition. I, and I think that's always been the question. How yes. Can, can you transition? But, well, I don't think that it's been, there's not been a real visible pathway. And to be building the bridges from something that people perceive, and probably rightly so, myself included, as, as predatory, really. Yeah. To, to be moving from that model to a model that is, is truly regenerative on so many levels. So... I, I, I am, uh, thank you for um, being somebody who is a visionary from a traditional industry moving into the future and providing that opportunity for people and taking that wealth of knowledge forward 
into an, a, a sustainable solution. I, I, you know what? And it's exciting because the, the system itself and the technology and where it can go building from one market into another and folding into communities and answering some of those questions. How do you go from A to B? How do you get there? And there's so much knowledge between the two. There's two. There's knowledge on the sustainable uh, agriculture and in that market of green energy and all of those pieces out there. And there's there's knowledge and learnings on the traditional, on the fossil fuel side. And the problem is, is getting them together in that same room. So when you start to do that, I, I sit back and I don't even know the, where they're going. I'm looking up acronyms and searching for words and definitions and going, but you can see it. It's just a matter, it's, it's sort of that time has happened and, and we're, we've reached that point where those conversations are much easier. But you're right that, you know, you have to transition. You have to be able to bridge those gaps, but you have to also be speaking the same language. And I think that's sort of where we've landed. We found a system and we're building that system out now that speaks the same language because we want to grow. We want to change and we want to do better. We have to. Yeah. But it also means we still have to have jobs. You can't just stop one and, and move to the other. Like, right. And that's the, that's that uncomfortable conversation. And we presented this technology, oh, about a year and a half ago uh, in, a, in Western Canada and there's, uh, and did an open house on it. And the majority of the people in the audience came from the oil and gas industry. Wow. So that's, the, you what know, was their response? Well, at first, you know, it was sort of some of the arms crossed or what is this? And then you start to explain to them that there's, pipes and vessels and to do this to take biomass or a lignus material or, or woody waste and turn it into something else you actually have to have that understanding of what it is it's a process and the room is full of welders and process engineers and guys that fabricate tanks and their eyes lit up and went oh oh okay there's maybe. room for us here there's, there's room for us here and there's yeah. room for their experience and what they do and then you take what the products are and you've got farmers who are like well what else can we use or we've got low-grade soils and and that's that piece that this is regenerative it it can be sustainable and it only gets bigger because the people that have the experience and the knowledge their brains are really big my job is to put them in a room and, and put the pieces together and go 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 be free and come <laughs> up with an answer and and that's and it is I'm, I'm I think I live in a mapping exercise more than I do anything else is just connecting the pieces that's, that's really beautiful. where this is yeah so you know what we've teased people now I think we've teased them thoroughly to, so that they're like what are you talking about let's back up and say what is this magical creature thing that you've created that does all these incredible things. So I think first and foremost, we have to give credit to the original parent company. So LG Aquaculture's technology created what they called their green powerhouse back in 2012, 2013. And, and it, it was featured in a movie, which is how we found out about it. Exactly. And we actually stumbled on it at an open house at a, an initiative, a green uh, sort of a transitional industry meeting in, West, in, in Edmonton of all places. And I uh, met one of their marketing people. And that's how I was interested. I was actually with a major coal company at the time looking for something to bring into the end of mine life. What do you bring into rural areas that are closing out that aren't going to use coal anymore? What do you do for jobs? And one of the things that coal mines often have are large tracts of land, which are often difficult to find. So if you can reutilize it and, and, and grow it, that's, and that's where we stumbled into the technology. And this technology, uh, the facility that's ex in existence right now in Whitefish is definitely on the, it's on the upper end of the R&D. They built it. Can I just interrupt, let me interrupt you for a second because people yeah. are probably super curious. I want to let everybody know, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm presuming you can provide us with some photos that we can put on the website yes. so people will be able to see what this magical thing is. Yeah, and the okay. one that's in Whitefish right now is definitely very visionary. And we've now sort of really started to change the envelope and how it gets delivered so it fits differently into a community. Um, but the system in, in Whitefish, Montana, that sits in the back of the Stoltz Lumber Yard and has for years, uh, they and that's who provides the, the biomass for this facility. So it is a combination of systems. And when we saw that, when we first stumbled on this, it seemed overwhelming. It's like, well, what is this beast that can do all of these things? And when you break it down, it is a series of systems that are connected together where one, uh, the input at one end and the output of another product goes into the next system. 
So very similar to how we capture heat in, a, in an operating facility or how we're kept capturing gas out of a landfill. Think of it as, an, as a closed system loop, and that's really what this is with some additional additives, some other pieces, but not uh, natural processes added to the system that allow for the development of additional products. So that's really what it is. It's a series of connected elements that have been brought together in a really, really intelligent design. So you said that it's essentially three systems. It is. The, the original design in, in Montana is three systems. We've done some build out from that, uh, but that's what it is. You have the, the biomass piece at the front end, which we see all over, we see people doing uh, biomass power generation, large grid type development, replacing uh, fossil fuels. You know, we're seeing pelletization more and more in, in the market. Uh, we are also seeing uh, companies using algae uh, for CO2 sequestration for the development of biodiesel. We have algae pools in this facility so or in the system, what we call our energy junction now. And then we also... And, uh, and algae is a great, uh, a great uh, asset for the soil also, right? It I is. Mean, and even yeah. as it is. And that's where it comes into everything has more than one purpose in the system. I think that's the other piece. Nothing is it. You can draw it out in a straight line, but you're going to have to tie it up in a big knot to figure out how this actually works together. Right. But it really is fundamentally three pieces where the waste stream or the output of one becomes an input on another and then recombining them in different pieces and changing, playing with temperature. Those pieces create a variety of different products plus power. And we're talking power on a behind the grid scale for additional greenhouses. We're not looking to deploy to the grid. There is a different market that's out there. This is about at first absorbing some of that power um, gap that's out there. The, the communities that have brownouts that live on, you know, uh, diesel fuels that need more support just to be sustainable, just to be able to grow their own food. So that's really where this sort of started to fit into the market for us. Would we be able to use it as an off-grid energy source for a small community? Yeah, and, that's, and, and that really comes down to what your feed source is. And we're looking, we have now sort of done some revamping on this where it's not just the biomass piece that we have as the power piece. We've, you know, a little bit of solar, a little bit of this, so that as systems, systems have to come offline. You have to do maintenance and repairs. And that was the piece that when we stumbled into this, there was a nuance that was missing to make it reliable for a community. And that's the other piece. It needs to be reliable and dependable for a community and for the, for, for, to really meet the market needs and the community's needs. Well, so let's go back. You said it's three components. Let's go component by component, if we okay. could. Yeah, so the front end of this is a biomass system. So we, you bring in woody biomass, and in our case, we can use other products, not just a dedicated wood wood um, through a, a process of heat we capture the heat and off gases with it and that creates the power so that really is the the carbon engine at the front end and that's um, what you're calling the feed source yeah so the feed source is put into it so we we've we've played around with uh wood uh woody biomass there's been a bunch of really great work done on recombining different types of masses from hemp waste and cannabis waste uh, flax seed with other products that you're diverting away from landfill into not necessarily a pellet but more like a briquette and so you are not just using one source you can actually sort of blend it but still get that dependable BTU or heat output that converts to power so that's that's front end. So does that mean that there's another manufacturing manufacturing or processing piece that converts the feed source into the pellets or there and there's those are available in the market. So there's lots of companies that create pellets or briquettes and things of that nature. And that's where this creates maybe a small niche, you know, another small economy within that community to, to take that waste product, create something that the system uses instead of just completely relying on the woody biomass. Okay. It's great when you have a lumber yard beside you. Absolutely, it's fantastic, but that's not realistic in this world. Not everybody has a lumber yard next door. So that's the front end. Okay. 
The second piece is what we refer to as the LG biodome. So it's a vertical, it's got a nice big dome and it, it does, it looks like a vertical farm, but in the bottom of it is a series of raceways. And in these raceways, that's where we actually grow and harvest the algae. So we actually grow algae in the pools. Uh, that's where the CO2 sequestration can happen. Um, it's a very, it's a subtropic environment. I absolutely love being in there. The first time I walked in, I thought I was in the middle of a movie. Uh, and, you know, there's big birds of paradise plants hanging all over the place. But it is, by definition, a, a space for vertical farming. And we harvest the raceway. So the algae is in there. We use a series of... Uh, pieces that come off of the front end and we grow the algae and then we we drop it into a tank and we move it to the third system but in that place you've actually got vertical farming that is available for growth all year round because you take the heat and you can create light we looked at what that light generation looks like as you move further north in areas where you need you how do you grow in the dark what do you grow in the dark all year round? So when you say you create light, would it be more specific? We can actually get into the power, into actually lighting that system. So you've actually got a longer, uh, longer growth season in that vertical farm or an adjacent or additional greenhouses. So that's something that we looked at. And there's some great technologies out there that, have, that stretch out the growth season. So you're creating high density, high quality food in a smaller footprint. And that's that piece that we started to add in. The existing facility right now lives purely on sunlight in the sense of the number of hours and the growth period is, is fantastic. It's and are you using the algae to help the, uh, provide nutrients to the plants that are in that facility? We do, but we process the algae first. So you take the algae, and and it, yeah, and you harvest the plot it. Thickens. It does, and that's where, it, and it does. It get that algae gets pretty thick. <laughs> okay. And and that's been part of the learning phase is that you take that algae, you drain it, and we actually then put it through a series of basically, um, I, I refer to it as wine making, uh, that you go and. It, goes through a series of, de uh, of tanks. And then at the end, we actually have a high density liquid biostimulant or organic fertilizer that can be recombined with products from the first, uh, from the first, from the front end, the biochar, or applied directly into the soil and onto plants as, uh, as a stimulant, basically a liquid for uh, organic fertilizer. So, so um, you could probably, you, I imagine you combine the algae product with the biochar as well to use as a nutrient dense yes yeah and it's and we have a couple of farmers that are in montana that have been using that for a while they're waiting on our next biochar run uh border crossings are getting a little interesting but what that what we do is and you're you're, you're actually creating the biochar unfolds kind of like uh carbon origami if you will and it has all these nice little pockets that hold water in the nutrient and you till that back into the soil um, in vertical farms or indoor farming, we see it actually applied directly. And then we're also seeing the, that product, uh, the Regenesis product, we've got sort of two versions of it now that we're also using for repairing soil, you know, and cleaning up of soil. So that, that little LG product that was, that was originally created has now become more than one product that goes into the into regenerative agriculture. Can you give an explicit description of the Regenesis project, a product? Because uh, you're mentioning it, but it, we didn't get there clearly. Really what it is, is you take the algae and we put it through three, three tanks and it sits for a period of time. And what happens is it really does become a super concentrate. So imagine a, a peat bog. A peat bog is very rich in nutrients. That's really what this is. A process that naturally happens in, in, in the environment is actually just being condensed in time in the facility. So you're getting very high quality high concentration nutrient for the soil without any other additional. So there's no other chemicals added to the system um, in this. And that's really where it can reduce dependency on existing fertilizers and move into that world where if it, for organic farming or processes uh, growth of uh, food products without any of the other fertilizers. So how, we're sponsored. How, how does the biochar fit in with the Regenesis or is there, are there two versions of Regenesis? 
Uh, there's there's uh, Regenesis itself is its own product, and then okay. we have the biochar. We actually have some people that just use the biochar. Biochar is really great in composting. Um, it helps to uh, grow. It helps with the composting process. We also find that people use the biochar as well to offset the pH in soil. Sometimes you're you know you you want you need to make adjustments in your soil for a better growing horizon. So sometimes the biochar is used all on its own. We take the biochar and we recombine it into what we call regenachar as well, and that is tilled in. So now you've got the high density nutrient with the biochar in as one product tilled back into the soil. So I'm sure that people listening to this are clamoring to know how can they get this wonderful substance to use in their soil. Yeah, and it is available online. We've actually just uh, we figured out. Uh, I, I believe me, I am. I'm. Uh, it's a learning curve when you take something that it has been online and you're re and you're recreating it for a bigger market. Uh, so the product is available, um, and we sell it online and we ship. Uh, so and we're moving into a bigger distribution model where there'll actually be hubs that we de deliver to, so that we're reducing that cost for us for an individual or a smaller operator to have to ship small. So we want to actually have it more um, on a larger commercial sale and cut down some of that logistics. In and there. as there are more centers, obviously it's going to cut down on the footprint for trafficking from one area to another. And that's the biggest thing. We learned a lot with where we are in in the market today as to what happens to products when one, when borders close and two dependency on packaging. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I mean, if we're looking at sustainable models, all of those things are important considerations. Well, yeah. before, yeah. before we go on, I just want to ask you, could you give people a website where they could actually go and make a purchase? Yeah, I will. Uh, and maybe that it's, it is uh, under the bioenergysolutions.com. And I can actually send that to you and we can go there. We'll, yeah. Well, you know what? We will post it on our website. I just wanted you to say it in the interview so that people could write it down and go to the website and check it out and see what's there. Yeah, and it is a new website. Uh, I am definitely not a website designer. I, I, there are fabulous people that help me through that process. And that's, that's where we're at is that we're really at that point where we're going to flip the switch this month into that commercial piece. Wow. And Taylor is probably sitting at the other end going, I'm not ready. <laughs> I need more containers. We need more hands. Uh, but that's that piece is that we, that's why the second facility, uh, the, the, the second facility to construct in the Canadian market. Now we have one on either side of the border, which makes things so much more realistic because you, this world, we've learned a lesson. Yeah. That border is not the same as it used to be. And it can't be for, it's not going to be for a while. Yeah. So the second facility, but the nice thing is, is that all of our facilities sort of a hub and spoke. There's always a, a hub that works with the other systems. So if somebody needs to come offline or something happens, you're integrated into each other um, and you help to balance that distribution and product needs. So yeah, it's getting, it's, it's getting exciting. So we, we walked through the different pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, and except that we didn't get to the biogas and electricity and... And all those other tentacles. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, th I think it would be great to go there. So when you have your uh, a heat to power system, like a wood uh, uh, conversion of that, we actually have liquid, uh, we actually have biodiesel or a heavy component that comes off of your pyrolysis system, the carbon engine, and that is actually a biodiesel. So we can actually take that, refine it. Right now at where we are in that commercial spectrum, we've got a couple of different companies that are taking it and refining it for us. So we literally put in a tub and somebody else will take that. The heat to power conversion, because of the amount of heat generated off of that, that's really where we get into that capturing of heat. And that's that conversion from heat to power that we put back into the community at large that's around us or into the greenhouses. That's the majority of it. We do capture quite a bit of uh, methane when we're producing the regenesis off the tank systems, the third component, there's methane that comes off of that, and that becomes another fuel source within the system. So we've had a couple of different engineering groups over the years take a look at breaking down what that looks like and where the different components come from. We've also done a little bit lately as what else can we capture to make sure we're not losing any of that heat so that the system stays warm and diverting everything we can back into that power conversion. Wow. Yeah. 
And wow. we're learning what an upset condition looks like in a in in this type of, of world because yeah. upset conditions mean you're going to be dependent on some other fuel source or power source. So is it a reduction in that reliability? You bet. And can we actually and now what is your backup? You know, so are you powering a generator or a backup system in the meantime? I mean, I think we've all seen them where you know your house goes offline and you have a backup generator. Is that what this looks like for a community? Um, and how do we make sure that that redundancy is built into the system going forward? Well, it's a mouthful. It One of the things that you said is that you're building in versatility in terms of being able to use different feed sources. So yeah. you were talking about wood and you talked about hemp and flax seed potentially. I'm wondering about food waste. There are great systems out there that have already been designed that, that take uh, food waste and convert it to heat and power and, and are, are fantastic. And we've had a couple of requests where can we build this into your system? And, and absolutely. And that's sort of the idea is that if this is a community that has a certain amount of viable waste that can actually help this system and that could be part of the redundancy in the system, fantastic. And those are literally off the shelf. We're not trying to reinvent it. We want to see how it connects together. Instead of being standalone pieces, how do we bring it in? So that food waste has an answer. There is a couple of hotels um, throughout North America that run a lot of their systems on that food conversion piece. And in a remote community that's or a rural community, instead of taking it to a landfill, that's a great piece to put into the system. So those ones are out there. So this is, this is so interesting. Just you actually have a really brilliant, innovative business model to go along with this innovative system. And I'm wondering if you'd maybe talk about that a little bit. We've recognized the need for flexibility in this, that it's not, it can't, it can show up as a kit, but what you're going to use as a feedstock is going to change based on where you are. And that means the system has to change. So the original design is very, it, the system remains integrated so that you stay in a carbon neutral or carbon negative environment. But we've had to really look into feedstock alternatives. And what happens with your feedstock alternative to the availability of biochar and can those, that char that comes out of your system still be used elsewhere? or are you now generating a different type of waste? So we worked on that front end flexibility to understand what those blending could look like for the power and heat stability uh, so that you can take it into a tropical region or a northern more remote where you're maybe you're using shipping pallets at one end and over here you're using seaweed and uh, you know uh, fallen timbers and, and coffee grounds for lack of a better description, co combining those. And that comes down to uh, heat to power conversion, the BTU, you know, the availability of that. And that's that flexibility that has to happen. We've also really looked at the system on a scale of functionality. Not everybody has an environment that you're going to apply biochar to the ground. Not every, so it, so do you change the temperature gradient and you live more in a liquid faction and create more power or, you know, so we, we play with that so that, a community doesn't wind up with a bunch of product that they don't have any use for. And that's that flexibility that we've really started to combine in the system. And once we have the second system up in, in Edmonton, we'll start to play with that as well with the one in Montana, so that what you actually have is the ability to watch what that, what that shift can be, so that it is applicable, not just to woody biomass industries or, or places of that nature. So it's been, it's, um, it's like a science fair every day, to be honest. Oh, you get the email, somebody says they read something, you're supposed to be doing paperwork or something else, and three cups of coffee later, you're down some rabbit hole on a, on a YouTube video going, I never knew you could do that. And I think that's the piece that we're connecting, because it's coming from traditional fossil fuel industry, it's coming from farmers. That conversation has changed very much as, well, what about this? And we do this in our chicken coop. Could we do this here? And I went, yeah, I think we can. And That's that, cute. I think, is where that flexibility really is coming in. But the intent is it shows up in a kit. You click it together. But we've already tested that feedstock. So it's already, we already know what it can do before it arrives on, in a community. And that probably is the biggest piece for us. I do have a question about feedstock because some so much feedstock is treated chemically. Yeah. 
So right now we're staying, we, there are groups out there that we're purely on the removal of that chemical piece, that there are feedstocks and we're staying out of that. We're staying in that, that feed train. Uh, but because of the way we can shift the system, we can still make the organic, the um, regenesis, the biostimulant, changing that front end. So if we have, say, a bunch of, um, say we have a, a, some wood waste that has come from somewhere that need, that could go through this, it would be basically you set, you, you stop, th slow down the system, you could use it, but then we actually have to do something else with that. So maybe it's a treating of that product afterwards to take it into a compost pile that we add the biochar that we've made other times. But it is about the willingness to say it's not just one designated, but you then you get into batch production. And when you're looking at batch production, now you need to have that ability to stabilize where you're putting that power or heat to the other pieces. But batch production is not uncommon. You quite often see it. I have friends that are a baker, and I think that's where I learned about batch production. You make a chocolate cake, <laughs> then you clean it, and then you make the other cakes. And that's, and that's really what this is, is that batch production still works in here, but what are we doing with that other waste stream? And, and with the products that we have in the system, we can actually do some very quick, very enhanced composting with the biochar and the regenesis that are available from the other systems. So we can actually turn it and improve it. So we've been doing soil remediation with the products with the regenesis, microbial remediation, and found that it, microbes like the regenesis. It is, you know, it's basically like a fuel for it. And the microbes just keep, they're more active and they were able to digest the hydrocarbons at a faster rate. But we, you know, it's just keeping the microbes happy. So we could look at that end, but we need a second system to do that. But it sounds like you're, what, you're taking precautions to remediate it in the process. Always. Yeah. yeah. And that's where, that's that other market. You know, what do you do with um, contaminated wood products. What do you do with those ones? How do you how do you get it to a point that can be used instead of just landfills and getting away from what we call dig and dump, where you know soils can actually be remediated. And a lot of that comes down to time. Some things we don't have answers for, but is there a larger portion of this that we can adjust the pH, then add some biochar, and then add the regenesis, and actually increase the microbial activity? And instead of just taking it and putting it into a landfill somewhere else. Land farms are, are great. Are, land farms are probably one of our best friends right now is to take the, the products in a sequence, in a, in a kit and go from soil that's not being used to soil that is actually available for agriculture or trees or willows and transition it. Regenerative. It is. So it is. there are probably people and communities that are listening and wanting to know how. Do they get one of these devices, these systems? Well, and that's where we're at, is the next system here is the, the Canadian build-out with sort of the enhancement of the Montana one. So we're, that's sort of the next six months. And then at that point, we are really working closely with the design piece because we've got groups globally that have lined up and said, we're in. Uh, so the, the, the pressure is on to get to that point, and that's where we are. So we're sort of six months away from launching the, the new full design. We have the, we have the envelope. We know what it looks like. We have all of the pieces. We have to put the second one on the ground. And that's always been the piece that when you go from R&D to commercial, you got to get the second one on the ground, and that's where we are now. And with it is also ensuring that the Montana facility and the facility up here can act as training facilities. You know, so do you, gonna, speaking of training, do you have a program that in mind at least, or you're in the process of designing some kind of training program? And, and what is the business model? Because you, you and I had discussed it, and it was so fascinating and brilliant, I thought. So from a training program, absolutely. Um, in a prior iteration of my, my life, I learned how to write online modules. And, and what we've taken is modules that exist in similar types of technologies where you're into, you know, what is the, the heat to power conversion? You take a module and you modify it. So there's actually a full training program being writ written with this and the construction, the maintenance piece. Do you have to be an engineer to qualify? <laughs> no, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> no. Well, you, yes, but you have experience in the industry. So somebody like me, could I come and take the training and know what I was doing with one of these? Absolutely. And that's where it's about some of the things that we have in existing 
industries from water treatment facilities to a variety of them where it is a control panel that says, oh, okay, my pH is going up. That says I add water. You know, that we want it to be, it's not about living on a phone. It's about the fact that you don't need to be an engineer. The company, the what we call the hub, uh, will have engineers that help with maintenance and say, and you can pick up the phone and go, hey, Steve, we don't know what we did. <laughs> can you help us? There, that's the idea is that there's a network of people supporting this all the way through. And that's also how the business model is set up, that it's not a big parent company. We have what we call an energy junction hub. And then we have what we're referring to as the agri nodes or the community nodes. And that hub helps manage a half dozen or possibly more of these community sized facilities. But that, that hub is also where it, it's, it, everything comes back to that hub. It doesn't necessarily go into the bigger uh, overarching company that holds the IP. So in a way, it's sort of a little bit like a franchise, a little? A, a little, a little. I think you can't get away from that, that word in today's market. Yeah. So, so you have these community hubs with the nodes. Yeah. And, and all these community hubs, what, what defines the community hub? Is that company owned? Is it owned by utilities? Is it owned by individuals? How does it work? So the model right now is that the hub will be sort of the sort of the brainstem, I guess, behind to make sure that all of the other ones are functioning. So there'll be a little bit more of a resource base in there to make sure that the operation and maintenance goes on on the other ones. But those can be uh, owned by a company or a community or a town. You know, ownership of this can, can be anywhere along that spectrum. We're not limiting to where that is. So right now, the uh, one in Montana is owned by four, uh, four people. So it's uh, two companies. Um, uh, there's a U.S. company, uh, Bioenergy Solutions, owns a portion of it. And then we have a, a New Zealand group that's in there and an individual. So the idea here is that through that system, we can spring out into new nodes. But what we have is the knowledge of that system. And if we have to take one offline, making sure that it doesn't fall off the grid, so to speak, that we're actually supporting those nodes that if they need to take something offline or are they producing something, that one of the other nodes needs. So maybe you don't produce everything, maybe you receive from the other. So we're connecting those pieces. Um, so the nodes can be, uh, any of them can be owned either by a community or an individual, uh, but they do function, the integration between them is, is sort of that piece we're really trying to achieve. And so if, could you just have one? Or yep. does it have, do you have to have more than one in order to give it nope. the backup support? You can live all by yourself. <laughs> so here's the million dollar question. How much? Uh, the original design was three and a half million USD. And that was, and I refer to that as a custom build because the gentleman, the group that was there, I mean, this is roll up your sleeves, make the tanks. And, and the group that made it in Montana that actually built the one, because the first build, there was a fire. You see that in the movie. I don't want to be a. The movie spoiler. was Grow Food, right? Yeah, it was called The Need to Grow. The and to grow. Uh, when we first stumbled into the technology and saw an opportunity. We actually helped to support the movie because it is, it, it helps with the conversation. Yeah. But there's a bit of a spoiler alert because there's, you know, the three, the three main focuses of that movie. Uh, that's when the, there is a fire at the facility. So when they rebuilt that facility, the, the company in Montana that rebuilt it and, and helped put it back together, they're still involved today. They actually will be part of that licensing. They're going to help with the licensing and deployment in the U.S. The idea is to make sure that the people that have been there remain involved if they want to be involved. So, yeah, so originally it was a three and a half million dollar bill, um, but we've also recognized that there are lighter uh, cheaper products. We can mass produce certain things. Uh, the raceways that we're looking at, more of an apron that's very light and modular uh, versus uh, concrete. And a lot of the tanks are already available on the shelf. So now it comes down to how many of pipe A do you need and, and how many of fitting B do you need to, to pull this piece together. So what we're actually seeing is the cost, price, the cost is actually coming down per unit. Depending on how many trains you want or if you want more you know and that's where do you want two sets of the of the raceways because you're in a big agricultural belt or are you in an area that you have diverse feedstock and you want two of the power system at the front end so you're not batch producing you're actually just separating it out and having 
you know, that, so that's where we want that flexibility to be. So that price point is coming down and we're getting closer to what that is, but then it always comes down to the, the envelope. Now you mentioned licensing. Yeah. So how does that work and how does the revenue model work and what kind of time frame are people looking at to be able to recover the investment? And I think at one point you said electricity is the byproduct. It is the byproduct. Yeah. So I we're, just want to dig into that a little bit too. So we're not selling back to the grid. We haven't, we're not in a scenario where any of the, 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 the facilities that we're looking to build out in the next couple of years are selling the power to the grid. So we're, we're, we're not in that. Do I think it's going to happen? Somebody's going to do it. Absolutely. And but, I think But meantime, you're talking about off grid kind of solution or supplemental solution. Yes, absolutely. That's and that's what we're focusing on. We're not looking to get into the power market. But I think you're going to get communities that are that it's easier for them to sell it onto the grid because of the distance between say the houses, or what it is they're currently relying on. I think they're, you know, um, I live in Western Canada. There's lots of different power suppliers out here. And it, and it, so you have to really think about where somebody else may need this in a system. But um, what we're looking at from a time frame is probably a year and a half when we get into that market of fully licensing out. In the meantime, what we have are some additional hubs that are going to be built so that we can actually expand into some of the markets that we've been working with. Um, and that's that's sort of that piece. That's really where we've landed right now. The model based on your biostimulant market and your biochar market, only from that piece and not from a power, we're basically looking at a rate of return of about four years on the facility at the current market price. That's extraordinary. Well, and you, you think about it, you think about the price of fertilizers and the things you put in you know, your garden, you know you realize what that market is and then we've diversified it into soil and remediation and remedial cleanup and things like that. We're taking one product and making it available in two or three industries. So it, it, it changes what that financial model is. And one of the requests we have right now is we're actually breaking down each of the components into their independent financial models. So a community can really see if maybe they are, you know, Maybe they, they don't need all three pieces all of the time. What does it look like when you turn something on or off? In the dead of winter, I don't know what many people that like working 24 hours a day in, in northern Alberta. So I suspect that there's, you know, that, and that's the other piece. Do you want to work 24 hours a day? And we don't want the facility to have to go there. So um, I have so many questions. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that you mentioned is transitioning and transitioning people in terms of jobs. Yeah. So, how does that work with how many people do you need to man one of these facilities? Um, or the one, ground, one of these facilities? Yeah. Well, you know, there, um, I think if I could uh, duplicate Taylor, who's at the Montana facility, and I could ha uh, literally run her through a photocopier, I would. Um, she, you know, we bring in people when we're ramping up production, but she has held down that fort. For, for, this, for a solid six months on our own. Uh, we don't do all of the pieces all of the time, but normal staffing of this at a comfortable level is probably about five people. And that doesn't include the collection of the feedstock coming in or the, the if you're doing a larger shipping piece. So those are things right now where we outsource to third parties uh, or the feedstock is already there. So the, the hub itself, the facility is about five people. Um, and that's where a little bit of automation and a little bit of balance go a long way um, versus Taylor and I on the phone at midnight trying to figure out what the heck <laughs> we just did wrong. There's a lot of those conversations as you, as you build something that's sustainable. And I think the, your question, do I have to be an engineer? What's the skill set? Um, the conversations that people had listened to the things that Taylor and I have bounced back and forth and trying to figure out, you know, how to make it so it makes sense to the non-engineer, that's probably been the biggest thing is that instead of over-engineering, we were removing some of that engineering. Yeah. But from a, yeah, and from a skill set, yeah, to build one of these, uh, to fabricate them, um, those will be your, 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 your pipe fitters and your welders and your millwrights. There's jobs to build these things. You put them together, and then all of those things take your regular maintenance requirements you know you still have to clean tanks you still have to look after the equipment otherwise it doesn't work every farmer knows that oh so there's a place in here for the farmer in the vertical farm there's a place in here for the the tank guy there's a place in here for an engineer that goes oh 
we should tweak that. I don't like that number over there. You know, there's a place for jobs in here with different skill set. It's not just one skill set. So I thank you for that. I know that we have a lot of people, especially now with COVID. Yes. And also, especially after the fires that were happening in Malibu and people realizing that uh, being tied to the grid is, is sometimes really dangerous, that yeah. more and more people are looking to live off grid. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you said that the electricity part, we're not looking to sell back to the grid at this point. However, you could provide power for a community, an off-grid community, right? Yeah, and that's, and that's that stability piece that we've really been working on. What does that look like and, and, and what's that extent? You know, how many that's what I'm, that's what I'm, where I'm headed here. Yeah, so the original, the original system, the existing system, the carbon engine, when the engineering groups, and, and that's a nice thing, I can rely on somebody else's engineering skills and not my math to do this, that they were, it was sort of 100 to 150 homes off of this, running it at 24 hours a day on the original design. And that's that piece is what is the original design versus where we're going now. Um, but that was, you know, six dry ton a day of woody biomass, 24 hours a day, but that was without any redundancy in the system, but that's 150 homes. And so now if you change your weight, your feedstock, and you blend that a little bit, and you create some battery retention or backup in the system, can you still do that? Yes, you can. So that was sort of the model we've been working off is to never lose that baseline and to grow stability and versatility into that system. So we're sort of in that 100 homes or six really large greenhouses. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I, I think of it this way is that I think a lot of what we're going to see in the original, in the first couple of years of build out are, are more along the lines of greenhouses, uh, supporting administrative buildings and towns and, and reducing brownouts, you know, there's, or the loss of power. Uh, I think that's where we're going to see a lot of the, the initial build out. And then as we get better and as we learn as to how to, move this into other areas we'll see it get into more and more into that community i I'm, I'm a i believe in de-risking a system and i i don't i get very uncomfortable when someone says well let's plug in 100 homes i'm like no not till i know that you've got a variety and i think that's sort of where my role really is is that it could grow really fast but is it going to be stable or are we moving it into a direction that it becomes unstable and unreliable and that's what we're trying to avoid here. Greenhouse food all year round, not having to use a diesel engine as backup, you know, getting away from some of those other fuels. That, that's the if we have to versus it's the only option we have today. Yeah. So I just want to bring it back to you personally because yeah. this is such a transition. And I, I just want, like you saw this, Set years ago, yeah. and what possessed you? <laughs> I mean, really, what possessed you to say, I'm going to take this on and make this happen? I don't know. You know how sometimes you see something and it just sort of sits in the back of your mind? It's the song you can't get out of your head. I have to admit, they had a great marketing guy in the beginning, and uh, there was something about him uh, that it was the way he presented it. It made me want to look. It made me need to look more. And I live, even today, a lot more on the, the environmental and the closure of mind pieces and, and that end. And what I saw here was an opportunity to transition some of these communities. They, what do you do when, a tech, when, when an industry is gone? What do you do for jobs and everything else? And that's what started to get into my mind. And then as I looked more and more into it, and we got into, we got into a three-year licensing agreement with the original parent company to build it out in Canada. And then we wound up in a position where now we have it. Now it's ours. And it was, there's something about it that says, I can't let it go. It has somebody, you know, it, it has some answers. It has. Some I, I just have to back up because you said yeah. you got an, a licensing agreement. So you already were in with both feet. Already in. Already in to build out in the Canadian market. Absolutely. So we had entered into a three-year multiple agree three-year agreement to build out the Canadian market and to build the second one. We actually made that announcement at the uh, Edmonton Film Festival up here in she's twenty. 2018. So it'll be two years this fall, um, and hopefully we break. We and 
that's when I say the build out time on this is about 60 days. Uh, there, it's not a big time to build 60 to 90 days. You know, um, most of this is we can, a lot of it's available in the market. Uh, there's certain pieces that we have to fabricate. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't let it go. It seemed to have an answer. We work a lot with communities. Like a lot of the, the coal industry lives in a, a small towns and near those small towns are also smaller towns that often don't have, especially in mining sectors or bigger resource sectors that don't have available power. You know, uh, just because you've got a coal mine down the road doesn't mean that it's producing power or providing something, you know, it might just be providing jobs. So we see communities that lose power and I really sort of got my head around that. And I live in the world of remediation and reclamation, closing and changing landscapes and the stuff that we've been producing and the ability to repurpose the land instead yeah. of putting it in, in, you know, burying it, repurpose it. Let's, let's use this and revitalize it. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So yeah. It's a win all around. Yeah. So I got it in my head and um, I don't know if I'm stubborn or willful, but I kind of got my, my head. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I just wasn't ready to let it go. And I, there's an opportunity here to have so many other people involved and to, and for it to be, because it doesn't take long to build, it can grow. You can turn it on like a set of Christmas lights and all of a sudden you have a half dozen and that's sort of the vision. Get a chain, you know, get them set up, have them planted and let them grow from there because I think that's really what you're going to see sort of that hub and spoke approach to this. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Kari, is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? No, I think we're good. I think we're good right now. And I know that you and I are going to continue to chat and I'd be more than happy to um, provide you with updates and where we're going. And when we do that first groundbreaking um, and introduce you to the crazy characters that actually kept this going. I mean, there's... that would be great. We would love that. And I think that's probably the piece. When I met the people that had sort of dug their heels in to hold on to this, um, you know, Chuck, Chuck Rohde and, and, and the Deans and the Taylors and the people that really sort of sunk their teeth and said, no matter what, we're going to, we're going to do this. We're not letting go. And it hasn't always been pretty. I think that that's probably why it, it, it continued on. I just maybe was a bit more stubborn and a bit of a catalyst that was needed at the right time. It's all about timing, I think. So would you just give folks your um, website again? I just want to let everybody know the links. Uh, we're going to have links. We're going to have photos references yep. on the website but in the meantime yeah so it's bioenergysolutions.com and it's bioenergy hyphen solutions so you will find us on there um and it is we're we're literally at that point we're just about to uh to tweak the uh the online uh, the the store if you will but we really are with with covid and and where we are in this world looking at larger hubs for product instead of doing you can't ship anything in this world right now because everybody's getting everything online so we're looking for that bigger distribution but that's where we're at and lots of new pictures and a new website and, and away we go beautiful kari thank you thank you thank you and thank, thank you for you. your stubbornness and your willfulness and your willfulness. <laughs> your visionary um your visionary insight and and the, the bridge that you're creating because I think so many of us look at the situation in the world and say uh, we know where we want to get but how do we get from here to there and you're creating a passageway for people uh, for for cultures to transition it's like Buck, Buckminster Fuller said you can't really displace a, a technology by trying to get rid of it you need to create something better you do and I think that's the piece is that that's probably what really where this is it is it's creating a bridge it's going to help connect pieces that right now uh, or previously have felt really disconnected yeah so, yeah and you said you said getting the um the engineers or the fossil fuel folks and the farmers uh, to speak the same language how about getting to them to speak i mean that's what you've done and <laughs> it is and yeah. so it's a pretty close to a miracle. <laughs> it, and you know what? I think they all of a sudden they realize what, what that opportunity is. And we've got just great people that, you know, um, as we grow, you know, uh, that have just put in sweat equity. There has been a lot of sweat equity. And I think that's the biggest thing is that the conversation, we almost started to create our own language, but we're getting there. And the answers are, the, the answers are starting to come. 
Yeah, and, and when we do start those conversations, that's when we can come up with entirely unanticipated, unimagined solutions. So Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, beautiful. I want to say thank you again to you. We're so grateful for what you're doing. And thank you to my co-founder and producer, Scott Billy, and to all of you who are spreading the word and taking the baton and making the world a better place. Uh, it's such a privilege to be engaged with you. And I invite you to follow us on uh, social media and engage with us. We have uh, Thursday night movie nights and Kari, I'm going to give you an invitation to that. And, <laughs> and um, I think that that's it for today. So until next time, live your best life, love the world around you. And together we really can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now. Visit sustainabilitynow.global to find resources related to today's program. While you're there, pledge your support by making a contribution to help us shape a world that works. And remember to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.